Okay, this is one of my, this may be my favorite Bible study. I, um, it just, I've sort of got a long history with this topic, and um, I, I'm really excited about doing it, I do it again. I like to redo things I've done. And I was thinking this afternoon, uh, when I was in elementary school, we went to California from Georgia, which was a big trip, and that would have been about 1960. Three, I'm guessing. And I think it was Texaco. You could write Texaco, and they would send you maps with yellow felt-tip pen on the best roads to take. This was before interstates. There weren't interstates. I mean, if you, but I remember, and my dad would tell me, now, Stan, if you find a better road, you know, we'll take your road, not Texaco's road. <laughs> But uh, I've loved maps. The point of this is I love maps. GPS is not a map. <laughs> it's really not. Yeah, it's, and you can follow a GPS, but you have no concept of which way is north, or you can't point to where you're going. You're not oriented to the map. You're just listening to this in our car. It's a female voice. <laughs> and our daughters used to always program it in French, so I had this French woman telling me, Tournez à gauche, anyway, that's here and there. But I love maps, and what we're going to do for, I don't know whether this is going to take us 12 weeks or 20 weeks to get all the way, I want to go to Jericho. We're going to start in Egypt and go all the way across the Red Sea, through the Sinai Desert, to the plains of Moab, cross the Jordan River, and I think I'm going to end with you at the Battle of Jericho, because that's the journey. And it's a very interesting geography. And we're going to see that journey as a, the spiritual meaning that it has and how that journey relates to our journey. Okay, so that's what we're doing. And I don't, when I preached this at Loudonville, I think it was 18 sermons, which is, my homiletics professor would have been horrified to preach a series of 18 sermons, but... Of course, he wasn't in my church, so I said, I don't have to listen to him. Um, let's dive in. Here we go. The Bi I'm going to be real quick on this first part. The Bible uses multiple images or metaphors to describe salvation. To grasp only one of, or two of these images is to have a partial or even distorted view of the purposes of God in redemption. For example, there's the courtroom picture or metaphor of salvation. Ah, you got to come all the way sit by me. That's oh, you can sit there. That's good. Welcome, Braybond. Glad you're here. Uh, you see the chart where we are? Many of us, I probably was converted when I heard the courtroom metaphor. I didn't know it in these terms at the time, but the idea was this. God is the judge. I broke the law, and I'm in big trouble. And if I can't find a lawyer, I'm going to be punished, and there's no way out. But thank goodness the lawyer... The, the, the judge's son is actually the lawyer who died for me, so the penalty of the law is satisfied and I'm pardoned. Now that comes from Romans, that comes from Galatians, that will preach. And in the 1970s, when we all still believed in the Ten Commandments and things like that, that could get a lot of teenagers to the altar pretty quick because we all knew we were guilty. Uh, another model metaphor, and, and you talk, I've just, I could spend, we could spend two or three sessions on this, and I don't want to, but this is very fertile for understanding salvation. It's the father and children metaphor, where, and the idea here is, you need to be born again. God needs to be your father. Your father naturally is the devil. That's what Jesus said to the Jews. You are of your father, the devil. They said, no, we're not. Abraham's our father. Jesus said, no, he's not. The devil's your father. <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. 
You need to be brought into a new family. And there's a whole, that, that preaches very well too. What we've been doing with Tim Philpott and I is we've been talking about the marriage metaphor. And a lot of people today are rediscovering that it's not just a judge, God is not just a father, but he's also the bridegroom. And he's looking for his bride. And that's, that's very fertile, and it's very biblical. It's all through scripture as we've been seeing. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're going to be talking about is a fourth metaphor that I just get real excited about, and it's this whole concept of a journey. And in the journey, who is God? Well, God is the Lord or the King, sort of the Lord of the land. It's His territory that I'm walking across. Who is Jesus? Well, He's either our guide in the book of Exodus, we're going to say he's the pillar of fire that's uh, basically saying, follow me, follow me. He's not just, he doesn't just show us the way, he is the way. <coughs> Remember when Philip said in the upper room to Jesus, Jesus, just show us the way to the Father. We'll be satisfied. And Jesus said, I am the way. It's like, what does that mean? It's like, follow me. I am the way. Who am I? Who am I in this metaphor, in this picture? Help me. A pilgrim. Pilgrim's a great word. What did you say, Becky? I say Israel. Oh, Israel. Okay, but on a journey. Yeah, and we're, we're travelers. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger. You think how many songs are on these kind of things? What is the problem? I'm lost. It's not that I broke a law in this picture. It's not that I don't have a family. The problem is, I don't know which way to go. I'm, and I'm homesick. Homesick is part of the problem, too. I know I may be... The Israelites had lived in Egypt 400 years, but they never assimilated. That is remarkable. 400 years. I mean, that takes us back like to Mayflower sort of days. Can you imagine living in the North America for 400 years and yet saying, but I'm not a North American. I've got citizenship elsewhere. Well, the Hebrews, they knew they weren't Egyptians, though they were eating Egyptian, sleeping Egyptian, smelling Egyptian, speaking Egyptian. But they said, no, we're not Egyptians. We're homesick. We don't know how to get home. We're lost. It's powerful, powerful imagery. Uh, what is the solution? Follow me. Someone's got to lead us on a journey. Journey. How do I become a Christian? Make a decision? Well, you can read the rest of them. But what we're doing is looking at this last category. So over the next few months, we're just going to talk about the journey. And we're going to look at the journey from Egypt to Canaan as not just history, but as descriptive of our own journey. Sometimes when I read the book of Exodus, I said, this book understands me. <laughs> and like the bitter, when you get to Mara, the bitter place, that's one of my most powerful places. He leads you right to the bitter place. Why would he do that? Or I'm thirsty. You know, why would he? But there's the pillar of fire leading me. Okay? While many postmoderns and millennials coming from broken homes. So think about the father-children metaphor or the marriage metaphor. If you try to preach that, sometimes millennials will say, I don't know how to relate to a healthy home. I, don't, I didn't have one. Many find it difficult to connect with the metaphors relating to the family. Preaching salvation as a journey tends to resonate with their life experience. You listen to how much millennials today talk about the journey. It's better to travel than to arrive, or, or these kind of slogans that get tossed around. But people love this metaphor because it's, it's real. It connects. Here are some ways it connects. Many writers... Roman numeral 2, 
Life as a Journey. Many writers, both ancient and contemporary, both secular and Christian, have built their stories around the central theme of a journey. And again, I would love to just sit in a circle and talk to you about some of these, but can I, I think it was, I was probably 50 before I ever read The Odyssey. I, and uh, it's actually a very good book. I said, this is very, it's about Homer, uh, excuse me, Ulysses, after the Trojan War, he's trying to get back to Ithaca, his home. And it takes him 10 years. And he, go, and he goes to the Cyclops Island, and then he goes to the Lotus Eaters, and the Sirens, who, you know, he plugs his ears, ties him to the mast. And, but it's a journey, and it's a meaningful journey. And when he gets home, they think he's dead. The only one at home that recognizes him is the dog. It's so beautiful. <laughs> the dog comes up to him and knows him right away. It's, it's power. And he, it's about homesickness. It's like Homer, Homer, the author, was on to something. The Wizard of Oz. We're not in Kansas anymore. You know, we're on this yellow brick road on a journey that, and it's the journey that makes the story. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, big time journey. They leave the Shire and go all the way to the cracks of doom, Frodo and Sam, in the land of Mordor. You can just say that. that's a that's a journey. And they're home the whole way, they just can't wait to get home again to the Shire. Gulliver's Travels, of the Way of the Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress, maybe the most famous book in English other than the Bible ever written. But John Bunyan starts out in the City of Destruction. There's a man with a burden on his back, and he's trying to get somewhere. An evangelist comes along and says, see that wicked gate? Just follow the road. Powerful. And he goes, through the, and the, he goes up the hill of difficulty. He goes through Bypath Meadow to Doubting Castle. He goes through Beulah Land. He crosses the river, Celestial City. I mean, Vanity Fair, where his best friend, Faithful, is burned at the stake. I mean, it's, just, it's a journey. And this, it's a great book because when you read it, you say, I'm on a journey too. I've, I've been to Vanity Fair. I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> I've been up the hill of difficulty. I've been on Bypath Meadow. I mean, it's, it's a good book. Okay, you can tell I'm excited about that. Here you go. On the back, the opening lines of Dante's The Divine Comedy. This is how the book begins. It's a three-volume journey. You go to hell, down nine levels of hell, then you go to purgatory, it's Catholic, <laughs> then you go to paradise. Those are the three volumes. But it starts with these words. Midway along the journey of our life, I woke to find myself in a dark wood, for I'd wandered from the straight path. I don't know, that moves me. And it's a, great, it's a great line for a midlife crisis. <laughs> you know, at about age 40, I woke up and said, what am I doing with my life? I'm in a dark wood. I don't know where to go. Wait till you retire. <laughs> Wait till you retire. <laughs> no, that's very true, Quentin. That's very true. And then maybe my favorite is Robert Frost in his uh, famous poem, The Road Less Traveled. If you haven't read these in a while, they're beautiful words. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. It's just, it's the journey. It's the journey. Well, the Bible understands this. In fact, the Bible is the origin of this whole concept. In the Bible, this emphasis on the journey of life is underscored by the recurring theme of walking. Uh, take your King James Concordance, which is your Strong's Concordance. The newer translations don't always translate the word walk. 
but it's in the Hebrew and the Greek, it's the word walk. The newer translations will say like, rather than walk in the light, it'll say live in the light or be in the light. But it's like the word is walk. But uh, it's a dual word study on the word walk sometime. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. They didn't just stand and talk to God. They were going somewhere. They were, they, they were on a mission together. Enoch walked with God. And one day they walked so far, I think God punched Enoch and said, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are to your house. Let's just walk on home. I love that story. Noah walked with God. Abraham walked with God. It says it in those terms. The book of Psalms, 150 chapters, begins, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. It, so it starts with, where are you going? Where are you walking? Uh, Isaiah, beautiful verse. And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Micah 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy, Walk humbly. Get those three things right, and you'll find your way home. Jesus called his first disciples by saying, let's walk together. Follow me. Paul exhorted believers, walk in love, walk in the spirit, walk in the light, walk worthy, walk carefully, don't walk like the Gentiles, etc., and even in heaven, this walk with God will continue forever. Revelation 3, 4, Jesus said to the church at Sardis, You still have there in Sardis a few who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white. So in heaven, we're going to keep doing the walk. I think Stephen Curtis Chapman has a song called Do the Walk or something, it's a, but I, I like that, just do the walk. So this whole picture is salvation is not just a ticket you get to heaven. It's not just changing your status before the judge. It's not even getting married, but it's, it's a walk. There's a journey. We're, we're going somewhere. Okay, we're at C. Now we're about to dive in. The most prominent illustration of doing the walk in the Bible, however, is seen in the Old Testament in the journey of redemption when God led his people from Egypt to Canaan. To understand the spiritual significance of this journey, one must know some basic geography. I've been thinking today, you've got to be old enough to remember these things. Don't know much about history. Well, the second verse, you, I, all the old people laughed. Yeah, that was a big song. Don't know much about geography. That's the second verse. And most of us don't know much about geography. Well, we're going to learn. And it's not just because we want to learn geography. We want to learn where are we going and what, what does it mean? Um, and no journey makes sense without a map. Not a GPS, but a map. <laughs> hey, this is fun. I'm already, we're already having a good time. Okay, look at the map a minute. And if you can think about it, bring this with you, uh, you know, because each time we're going to be talking about, well, where are we on the map? Because what we're going to do is just follow the children of Israel, from Egypt to Canaan. All right? And there's a lot between. And there's a lot of biblical material. We're going to cross the Red Sea. We're going to follow the dotted line there. We're, this is just a traditional journey, and I know there's some debate on where did they actually cross the, the Red Sea and all this, but I'm not going to get into that. I'm, we're just going to... Let the traditional map uh, work for us. We're going to go to Mara, 
the bitter place. That is stop number one on your journey of salvation is the bitter place. I cannot get over that. And it's not because God is cruel. It's because he wants to teach you how to turn bitter things sweet. Because if you don't learn that lesson, it's going to be a really hard journey. But if you learn that lesson, every time you hit a bitter spot, you say, okay, we can handle this. I, it's, it, it's like, that's my, that's my story. We're going to go to the wilderness of sin, which is not sin as in doing bad things. It's sin as in Sinai, S-I-N. It's, it's a name. But at the wilderness of sin, that's where they get manna for the first time, water from the rock. The Amalekites attack them. What do you do when somebody's trying to kill you in the desert? And God says, I'm so glad you asked. I'm ready to answer that question. Because if you don't learn how to handle the Amalekites in the desert, when you get to Jericho and meet the orcs who are camping out on your inheritance, if you know the orcs are the people from Lord of the Rings, but, uh, th that's who you got to fight when you get to Canaan. So that's why the desert is so important. We're going to get to Sinai. Then we're going to head north, go to Kadesh Barnea. That was where disaster hit. And God said, well, if you don't want Canaan, you can spend the next 38 years doing laps in the wilderness. And then we're going to talk, after the laps in the wilderness, that's when um, the snake story comes. <laughs> I love the snake story because uh, I hate snakes, but there are snakes in the, in the desert. That's where the Moabite women story come, where the Moabite women start seducing the Hebrew men Pretty interesting story. That's where Moses gets so upset, he beats the rock twice. And God says, okay, you can't go in. It's like, really? You're not going to let him in because he lost his temper? Um, Korah's rebellion. Miriam, who's Moses' big sister, gets upset with her baby brother. And God strikes her with leprosy. <laughs> That's a great sibling story. Uh, but those stories are all in the desert. And uh, we're gonna, I don't know if we'll deal with all of them, but they're all journey stories. And they're, it's good preaching material. And it's like, I've got sibling issues. <laughs> I really do. I mean, that's, that's hard. And sometimes I wish leprosy was one of the options. Uh, anyway. Yeah, there's... Okay, a few comments. The map introduces us to the geography of salvation. You've all, we could, we could study the psychology of salvation. We could study the theology of salvation. We could study the history of salvation. We could study the sociology of salvation. But I've never heard anybody frankly, but me, use this word, <laughs> the geography, which scares me. But it's like, this is a great term, because there is a geography if there's a journey. And where are we going? And we're going to let this map inform our understanding of the geography of salvation. Places on the map are not arbitrary or random. Each one has spiritual significance. Okay. Number two, the journey of the Jewish people 3,400 years ago is not just interesting history. It is a picture of the Christian life. It is not just their story. It is my story. Their journey helps me better understand my journey. I hope that uh, this is true for you. I hope you'll say, wow, I... This, this is not just interesting history. This is helping me understand where I'm at. I'm doing laps, or I'm stuck, or there's Moabite women trying to seduce me, or whatever the situation may be. Uh, number three, at least two writers in the New Testament used the map of the Exodus to help Christians understand their own spiritual journey. In other words, they were preaching the map. So this is what I'm trying to do 
for the next three to four months is preach the map. And the two writers in the New Testament who I'm trying to imitate are A, the writer of Hebrews, who in chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews preached a whole sermon on what happened at Kadesh Barnea. And he warns Christians about the danger of spiritual arteriosclerosis, <laughs> hardening of heart. And what the writer of Hebrews says is what happened at Kadesh Barnea when they turned back and said, we don't want to go in, there's giants over there. He said they had hard hearts, arteriosclerosis. And literally, in Greek, the word is sclerotic hearts. They have sclerosis in their hearts. And he says, don't let that happen to you. It's like, I understand that. My heart, as a Christian, can get hard. B, and the one we're going to look at tonight, is Paul, when he warned the Corinthians about the danger of falling from grace. And to address that, he preached the map. We're going to look at that in just a moment. Just a few basic observations concerning the map and the geography of salvation. So uh, you got the map in your mind there? Though the Hebrews had lived in Egypt 400 years, this was not their home. Where is home? Is, uh, oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? Where's home? Where, where are we homesick for? Good stuff. Number two, the moment, so next week, next week we're going to talk about Egypt. And we're going to look at Exodus 1 to 3, the first three chapters of Exodus, and just talk about what it means to be a child of God living in Egypt. That's powerful stuff. And that's right where the journey begins. Number two, the moment of redemption came when the people crossed what? The Red Sea. The Red Sea. So that was one of those crisis sort of moments when I'm not in Egypt anymore. I'm not Pharaoh's slave anymore. I am free. The Red Sea is that moment. And we're going to talk about that. Number three, Mount Sinai where the law was given, comes after redemption, not before. Sinai is not in Egypt. One of the church fathers, I forget which one, uh, but I mean, by church fathers, I mean 1,700 years ago, but that was sort of his thing. Sinai is not in Egypt. Sinai is not in Egypt. And, and when I first heard that, I said, what, what do, of course it's not in What do you mean? And what he means is, you don't obey the law to get out of Egypt. You get out of Egypt so you can obey the law. It's like, that'll cure any Pharisee of legalism if they really get that. And, of course, in Jesus' day, they didn't. They lived as if Sinai was in Egypt. In other words, one does not obey God's law in order to be saved, but because one already is. And hopefully that will make sense as we follow the map. Number four, Canaan is where in Israel's inheritance lies. It's a place of fruitfulness. Nothing grows in the desert. You can put seeds in the ground all day long and nothing will happen. But when you get to Canaan, it's like north central Indiana. I mean, it just everything grows. It's just green. Uh, it's a place of fruitfulness where battles are fought and won. So stop number one when you cross the Jordan River is Jericho. There is a battle. I thought you called this a land of rest. And God winks at you and says, it is. Well, there's Jericho. I'm supposed to fight it. You are. But just whistle and walk around the city for seven days and see what happens. 
You won't break a sweat. And you'll be victorious. Is that how it works in Canaan? Yeah. And if you learned the lessons of the desert, it makes perfect sense. It's good stuff. Um, the moment of entering Canaan came when the people crossed the Jordan River. So you've got these two major events, Red Sea, Jordan River. And in between is the desert. On one side is Egypt, the other side is Canaan. And incidentally, I can find nothing in my Bible that tells me that Canaan is a picture of heaven. We're going to talk about this a lot. The, our hymn book will tell you that Canaan is a picture of heaven. And I think that's what John Bunyan believed. I can't quite figure out John Bunyan on that one. But I don't see Canaan. I don't think we fight battles when we get to heaven. I don't think there's Canaanites <laughs> living in heaven. Um, Canaan is a picture of the abundant life, the victorious life. Um, we can talk about that some more. We will as we go down this journey. Um, number five, Egypt is not contiguous. It's a great word. What does the word contiguous mean? Side by side. So in other words, when God said to the Hebrew people, I'm going to take you out of Egypt, yay, everybody cheers, to a land of milk and honey, yay. I really would like to know how much the Hebrew children understood the map. I sort of think they thought, well, when we get across the Red Sea, that must be Canaan. <laughs> it's like, sorry, God didn't make that clear. And he did it for a reason. He didn't make it clear. But when you get out of Egypt, you are not in Canaan. You are redeemed. But this ain't the land of milk and honey. This looks more like Death Valley than paradise. This is the Sinai Peninsula, one of the most desolate places on planet Earth. It's like, where's the milk and honey? And I think God just smiles and says, follow me. What are we going to drink? Follow me. What about the snakes? <laughs> follow me. It's such a good story. Um, Egypt is not continuous with Canaan, a desert lies between. Passing through this desert is inevitable. It is a good thing willed by God himself. Um, American evangelicalism has no theology of the desert. And I think we're dying. I think Joel Olstein doesn't know what the desert is. That's a terrible thing. I shouldn't. That was judgmental. But uh, I think it's true. Number six, not everyone who had enough faith to get out of Egypt had enough faith to get in to Canaan. We're going to see this over and over. What happens if I get out of Egypt and it takes the blood of the Lamb and the water of the Red Sea? It takes blood and water. This is very gospel. Nobody gets out of Egypt unless the Lamb dies and you get through water. We talk about the sacraments and the symbols of that. So what happens if I'm redeemed, I'm out of Egypt, but I'm not in Canaan? And what if I die in that spiritual no man's land? We're going to talk about that. Because a lot of people died in the desert. And that's why Paul preached his sermon and Hebrews preached their sermon. Don't die doing laps in the desert. Possess your inheritance. This, um, yeah, for 38 years they did laps in the desert. This desert is not inevitable. It's the result of sin and illustrates a wasted life. It should have taken them two years to get from Egypt to Canaan. That's what Kadesh Barnea was. They'd been traveling about two years. And God said, Send the 12 spies, go possess your land. And Israel said, not going to do it. 
And God said, fine. You like the desert? Just live in the desert. Die in the desert. And when your children are grown, we'll try this again. It's like pretty heavy stuff. Barbara, you're smiling at me. This is just such good stuff. I, it, it relates. And it'll preach. It's great preaching material. Because we, it relates to how we live. Number seven, salvation is a journey. Any quick questions before? All of that's introduction. We're about to have our Bible study. <laughs> but it's long introductions make for short sermons. They really do. That's really true. Any comment or question before we look at 1 Corinthians 10? Joshua and Caleb? I think so. And we need to ask, well, what does it mean to fall? And how far do you fall? Um, let, let's just leave it with the question at the moment. Oh, what's the scale? You know, that's a very good question. I don't, uh, I don't know what it is on this one, but it's about... When I was in uh, Sunday school growing up, I remember, you know, hearing it took 40 years for them to cross the desert. And I can, I can literally remember saying, 40 years? Let's just say they traveled five days a week, maybe 10 miles a day, 50 weeks a year, times 40. I mean, it's, that's like thousands and thousands of miles. I said, that must have been a huge desert. And then I did the scale thing, and I said, well, how far is it from Mount Sinai to the border of Canaan? And it's like 90 miles. And then it dawned on me, they weren't walking in a straight line. They were doing laps in the wilderness. It was a wasted, futile life which many people who sit on pews of churches. And if you think, here's the big theological question. If you think that Canaan is heaven, meaning then the desert becomes this world, so doing laps in the wilderness is normal Christian life. We're all messed up, and the best we can hope for is in every way, in every way we sin, we're messed up, we just keep doing laps, but hey, when we die, we're going to go to heaven. Isn't that a great gospel? It's like, but that's what is preached. It really is. And we make Romans 7 the normal Christian life. I don't understand myself. I don't do what I want to do. I do what I don't want to do. I just do laps. But thank God I'm saved. It's like, what does that mean? It's not a very glorious gospel when it's, heard, when it's preached that way. That's why this is so relevant. Um, I was talking with a, a younger mom who's about 40, um, and she was, the realization came to her. I wonder um, um, how, how do I say this? Oh, um, I wonder what we're um, not allowing our children to do. Like, for example, if we save them all the time or keep them from bumping and things like that. And so the Mara so um, going to the Mara then is that because it is scriptural that oh. you know oh. there are bumps. And so if you're always hovering and, and 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 you know rescuing and things like that, that's that's not even it's not good, but it's not even biblical because Mara is part of it. But I'm going to pass that along that about the Mara and so that because it is bitter. And then like you say if, if you learn that early, how to do oh. Mara, how to do bitter, then... At a personal level, this study, nothing has helped me more than the desert, the role of the desert. And the first of the 40 years in the desert, the first two years were really good experiences in the desert. They were hard. They were bitter. We're hungry. It's bitter. They're... The Amalekites are attacking. Uh, but God said, that's okay. That's okay. You're right where you're supposed to be. I'm going to show you what I can do in the desert. 
it's the last 38 years of the desert that becomes just a wasted life. We're just doing laps. We're not going anywhere. But excellent, excellent. How do you say that people are saved? You know, well, you're saved. Well, but then you say, well, you're redeemed. But there's still the journey. You know, it doesn't, you know, it's not like, oh, everything's whitewashed after that. You are redeemed. But there's, a, there's, there's still journey. Yeah. Yeah. So That's that, why I love this metaphor. Yeah. This metaphor just helps complete the, the courtroom and the others. It, uh, you're getting it. Take your Bible. We've got uh, 15 minutes. 1 Corinthians 10. Now, this works because I want you to... When I began to... Um, maybe two comments here. When I began to get excited about the map and wanting to preach like this, I remembered... I had been warned in seminary, you know, don't be allegorical in your preaching. Allegory is bad, sort of what I was taught. And there are some, a lot of bad examples of allegories, of allegorical preaching. And so I said, well, is that what I'm doing? And then I, two things happened. One, I found 1 Corinthians 10. And I said, well, Paul is preaching the map. If Paul can preach the map, and if Hebrews can preach the map, I can preach the map. I don't have to apologize to anybody, whether it's allegorical. I don't know what it is. But if Paul can do it, that's a good example. That's good enough for me. And the other thing is, when you read like 19th century, and particularly holiness preaching, and by 19th century, I mean the 1850, say, to 1950, that era. You read Andrew Murray. You read R.A. Torrey, some of these guys. They preach the map. They talk this way a lot about Canaan, about the desert, about crossing the Jordan. Don't just cross the Red Sea. You've got to cross the Jordan. You've got to enter in. And they use this map language, and almost nobody preaches that way anymore. And I wonder, where, where did that go? Because it's such rich material. And Paul did it. Paul did it. Hebrews does it. So that's sort of my, my thing. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians 10. Let me, uh, first of all, who is Paul talking to? Before I read it. Okay, he's talking, one, to Christians. That's important to know. So he's using the map to talk to Christians. And two, he's talking to Corinthians. Now, who was in the church at Corinth? I think they were mostly Greeks. There, may have been, there were probably some Jews in the church, but he's, he's using the Old Testament map to tell a bunch of Greeks that this is your story. This map I'm preaching is your story. That, that's overwhelming. And it's very good news. It means it's my story too, because I'm a Greek. I'm not a Jew. I'm, these are not my people and my tribes. I sort of wish they were. But Paul says, that's okay. It's your story. <clears throat> our father, listen to how he starts. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers... You Greeks, these guys doing the, doing the walk in the, in the Exodus, they are our fathers, were all under the cloud, meaning the pillar of fire that led them every day through the wilderness. They all passed through the sea, the Red Sea. They were all baptized. What an interesting word to use for passing through the Red Sea. Paul says, that was their bab that, that's baptism. It is? <laughs> they didn't know that. I didn't know that. But it is their baptism, and it involves water. Entire immersion, no less. <laughs> don't care about that one. I don't know. Maybe it was sprinkling. I don't know how they, they got through it. They passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. Now we're talking about manna. But it's also an allusion, I think, to communion. There's, 
spiritual food. It's not just physical food. It's what Jesus said. It's the bread of heaven. It came from heaven. What's heaven bread? It's, it's different, and you need it in the desert. Man doesn't live by bread alone. That was said to people in the desert. But every morning you open the flap of your tent and there's bread, but you eat that bread to know that you need more than that bread. That's what you learn in the desert. It's like, that's a good lesson. You mean even when I'm full, I'm still hungry. And God smiles and he says, you're getting it. That's exactly right. Um, and they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was, was Christ. I, wow, that's a new way to look at the rock. And he says the rock followed them. I don't, still don't quite get how the rock followed them, but Paul is preaching the map. And he's saying these are our fathers, this is our story. And you Corinthians which is the most immature, carnal church in the New Testament. To correct your immaturity, I'm going to talk to you about the map. Verse 5, Never, Nevertheless, now he's beginning to preach, Nevertheless, with most of them, everybody but Joshua and Caleb, in fact, God was not pleased, and they were overthrown in the wilderness. What words do you have for overthrown? Scattered, destroyed. destroyed. Yeah, it's a. So you got all these dead bodies. They're not in Egypt. Praise God. <laughs> they're not in Egypt. That's a big praise God. But they're not in Canaan. They died in between. Now that's, that's Paul's text. And what he's going to say is don't let that happen to you. Now there's a picture of purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's that in between. No, it's that in between. That land of in between. Verse 6. Now, these things took place as what? Warning. Examples. Does anybody have a footnote that tells us what the Greek word is for the word example? Types, excellent. Tupas, or type. And if you know anything about theology, you've got types and anti-types. The type, um, Aaron, for example, is a type of Christ the high priest. You know, or the lamb, Passover lamb, is a type of what happened on the cross where Jesus was the lamb of God. There's a type. So Moses is saying what happened in the wilderness is a type. It's an example. It helps us understand our lives by what happened to them. Big word. These things took place as examples for us. And he, then he names four things that we might not desire evil as they did. One, don't be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's the golden calf. Exodus 32. Verse 8. Don't indulge in sexual immorality. This is the Moabite women story. When the Moabite women start seducing the Hebrew men. I mean, it's just Hollywood couldn't come up with a better story than this. Uh, and what happened? Some of them and 23,000 fell in a single day. Verse 9. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did. And they were destroyed by, there's the snake story. The serpents. Um, verse 10. I was doing fairly good until I got to verse 10. Don't grumble, as some of them did. And there's a lot of grumbling in the wilderness. It's a theme that is repeated over and over and over until God gets so fed up. It's what I think a mother feels when she's been in the kitchen, hot kitchen, all day, preparing a meal for the family she loves so much, and, Mom, I don't like this. Do I have to eat this? You know, and it's like, Ugh. 
uh, do you know how much love went into that and, you don't even, and you're grumbling? That's what God feels. Don't grumble as some of them did and they were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, the word type again. But they are written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, here's the conclusion to his sermon. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And here's the promise. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Pretty good sermon. A few points, and we'll go home. You got your paper? All right. Can I ask you a question? This grumbling. Was, this wasn't just grumbling against each other. They were grumbling about God. But they, were, they were upset with it. They just, it's like, or, we deserve better than this. Yeah. I, we, don't, we don't like how you're running the universe, God. You could do you could do it you could you could do it a little better. I've said that a few times. I've said that a few times. Of all the churches in the New Testament, Corinth was undoubtedly the most immature and carnal. The church had problems with divisions, sexual immorality, charismania, and false doctrines and others. Paul chose to address these issues by preaching the map. That's pretty important. If you're a pastor and you know your people are not living where they ought to live, what should you preach on? Well, at least in this instance, Paul said, I'm just going to preach them the map. I'm going to try to scare the hell out of them. <laughs> and I'm not swearing. I'm going to say, two million people fell in the desert. Don't be so stupid. It'll preach. It really will. Um, Paul chose to address these issues by preaching the map and teaching these Greeks the geography of salvation. The journey from Egypt to Canaan is no longer an ancient story about other people. It becomes my story today. Now these things happen to them as an example that they are written down for our instruction. <clears throat> okay. Here we go. This is the sermon. Paul's sermon has four applications for the believers in Corinth and for us today. We could call them maplications. I made up that word. No kidding. <laughs> okay, we're going to make four maplications. So here they are. A. Salvation is a journey. Be informed. So Paul is telling the Corinthians. Salvation is not just getting a ticket to heaven. It's not just getting a pardon from the judge. It is a journey. Where are you on the map? You know those maps when you go in the mall and you look at, the, and what are you asking? It's like, where am I? And I'm looking for that red dot that says, you are here. Well, that's what the map does. Uh, it's like you look at the map. Where is it? There's the map. Where's the red dot? Where are you? Are you in Egypt? Are you in Canaan? Have you just started? Where are you? And I think Paul is telling the Corinthians, figure it out. Eternity is hanging in the balance on how you answer that question. So salvation is a journey. Be informed. It's not just a ticket to heaven or a get out of jail free card. It's a walk from one place to another. Jesus said, follow me. How can you call yourself a Christ follower if you're not following? Very good question. B, here's the second application. Not all who start the journey finish, so be wise. Spiritual blessings do not guarantee spiritual success. I think the people must have said, when they felt God was upset. Well, we, we were there when the ten plagues came. We went through the Red Sea. We eat manna. We've experienced incredible blessings. 
We're just living in disobedience today. But isn't that okay? It's like the game I play sometimes when I say, but I went to Asbury College. <laughs> I've heard really good preaching. I'm guessing I were there at the same time. It's like, doesn't that count for something? Not really. I mean, not really. What counts is, am I following where he leads? Spiritual blessings don't guarantee spiritual success. That's part of what the map teaches you. Uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. C, the third map application. There are certain dangers that all pilgrims face, so be alert. Paul does not mention every temptation that the Hebrews faced during the Exodus, but he zeroes in on four because he knows how often the followers of Christ trip up at these places. And it's very interesting. So the four he mentions are idolat don't be idolaters like some of them were. Sexual immorality. The Moabite women. That's Numbers, yeah, Numbers 25. Hopefully we'll get there because it's such an interesting story. I don't think that's the story where the earth opened up. That was Korah's rebellion, I think. But it, where the, it, these are dramatic stories. And they're meant to say, don't do those stupid things. Or don't put the Lord to the test. And then grumbling. If you don't like snakes, don't grumble. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Thinking we are immune from moral failure is perhaps the surest way to allow it to happen. Edmund Burke says, those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. Don't know much about history. All right, and the fourth map application. We are right on time, guys. This is going to work. So far, it's been sort of heavy news, but D, God is faithful, so be encouraged. Verse 13, let me just read it again. God is, uh, no, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This wonderful verse tells me that if I am struggling with temptations and trials in my journey, just in case that might possibly apply to anyone in the room, here's three responses. One, I'm normal. No temptation has overtaken you, but it's not common to man. It's normal to be in a dry, dusty place saying, what is going on here? Paul says, it's okay, you're normal. You're following the pillar. He's led you here. He knows what he's doing. This is normal. That's reassuring. Second bullet, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Though he takes you right to the edge, <laughs> I think. And third bullet, victory is promised. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You know, the manna story is so powerful, we're going to look at it. But what do you do with two million hungry people in the Sinai Peninsula? And God in the pillar of fire is just smiling at them, saying, I brought you here, trust me. Just every morning, open your tent flap. There will be just enough bread to get you to sundown. And then tomorrow morning, we'll do it again. And we'll do it for 40 years if we have to, just to prove to you. I can't tell you how many times I look at my checkbook and I say, Lord, we're not going to make it. 
And I've been saying that for like 50 years. It's like, it's like, who's the dummy here? Rich, Richard? You're going to just point out, you know, trying to move 2 million people. That would be, uh, moved in five miles. <laughs> <laughs> For me, the key verse in the whole map thing is Deuteronomy 6.23. We'll come back to it, but I have tacked it on right there where uh, Moses says, He brought us out that He might bring us in. That's just that. He brought us out. He wants to bring us in. Gus. I mean, real Um, I think so. What's behind your question? Or I'm okay. Revival is tends to be understood, I think, as sort of a sporadic or not a continuous. That's an interesting question. Should revival be continuous? I think, for me, Canaan is a place where things grow. Maybe call it a type of? I think it could be, yeah. Things grow and there's victory. Yeah. Doing laps in the wilderness. When hard becomes easy. Yes. We're going to talk more about Canaan, but, but God calls it a place of rest. But that doesn't mean you're going to find a hammock and just take naps all the time. <laughs> no, there's battles to fight. There's crops to plant. But my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus thought this way. It's good stuff. Let me pray. This is real good. Lord, I am so honored to get to take this journey with a group of people like this. And we pray that your word would just come alive for us, that it would live in our hearts and our minds, and it would enable us to make sense of some of the bitter stuff that's going on even in our lives now. You be our teacher, and uh, let the spirit and the word have freedom in our hearts and in our minds and even in our world. Now, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Keep us safe as we travel tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week is Egypt. Exodus 1 to 4. 1 to 3.